Welcome to the first lesson in Topic 2 Atomic Structure 2.1 The Nuclear Atom. These are the objectives that we will go over in this lesson. Please go over the first video, Nature of Science, Foundations of Chemistry, to understand how these particular particles were discovered. This particular PowerPoint will go through just the facts you need to know. So first of all, the protons and the neutrons are in the center, and the protons are the positive ones. It's good to know later for Topic 2 and Topic 3 that this thing is really quite small, something like a tennis ball. Uh, in the size of this thing here which would be like a, a football pitch. This just lets you know that the nuclear size doesn't really change a lot so the, the real significant impact of this is the charge not the size of the nucleus. These words are also called the protons and the neutrons they're also called nucleons whereas the electrons here you can see that there are huge distances and gaps with these different shells that are created on the outside so the distances are quite significant when it comes to the electrons but there's not much difference in the radius here just of the nucleus but there is a huge difference in the radius of the entire atom which is due to the electrons. You don't need to know these numbers now, it's in your data booklet. In the past you needed to know a proton's positive and it's given a random value of 1. This of 1 is assigned to carbon, uh, a carbon 12, which has 6 protons and 6 neutrons. That was the randomly assigned measurement uh, of this unit. So in effect, really, they're saying the protons and the neutrons are just a, a one unit. And so the proton is, is plus one. The neutron has a mass of one, and it, has, it is no charge. And in the past, the electron was, was considered insignificant. As a rule of thumb, anything with a three significant difference is usually ignored. This is most important here that it has a charge, but now you have the actual numbers to work with. Please be aware too that these are relative masses, and so there's no units on these things. Now, for some horrible reason, they didn't write atomic number as A, they decided to use Z. And for mass number, they didn't use M, they decided to write A, so you could possibly confuse it with this one. Now, um, this is the way that you've been given it, but it doesn't really matter if it's a Z on an A. You should realize that if it's the mass number, whatever is the bigger one is the A, and because that's both the protons and the neutrons. And the smaller one is the number of protons, which is the atomic number Z. Going to the first problem now, calculate the number of neutrons and protons in chlorine. You have the symbol here, and so the smaller number must be the number of protons, so that must be 17. And the larger number must be the mass number, which is the number of protons plus neutrons. The mass number is 35. So the number of neutrons is the mass number minus the atomic number, which is 35 minus 17, and that gives you 18 neutrons. Moving to isotopes now, please have this definition memorized. This element, the atoms are the same element, Therefore, they must have the same atomic number, same number of protons. But the, what happens is there is a different number of neutrons inside the nucleus. So the way we write that is in, in written form, we write chlorine 35, chlorine 37. But in symbolic form, uh, we'll just write 35 Cl or 37 Cl. This usually doesn't need to be written because if it's not 17, then it's not chlorine. So here you can see there are 18 neutrons here. That's why this one only adds up to 35, but there's two more neutrons here, so this one adds up to 37. Here is another example, something that's a little bit more common, carbon-12 and carbon-14. If you count up the pink ones, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that must be the number of protons, otherwise it wouldn't be carbon. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, so the green ones must be the neutrons and so there would be six of everything in the top one. So because the only difference is these, these neutral particles stuck in the nucleus, uh, the chemical properties are exactly the same because the chemical properties depend on the electrons and interactions of the electrons. So what would happen if these, the chemical properties are the same, the physical properties are slightly different? Because they're different masses, they're going to move at different rates, so the diffusions are going to be different. The lower densities, of course, because there's, there's more mass, the volume it takes up is not going to change. So if it's, uh, it's going to have a different density. And lower, uh, lower melting and boiling points are going to occur because it is heavier, so it's not going to be able to move off into a gas as easier. 
Just going over some uses of radioisotopes. Radioisotopes are isotopes that have an unstable nuclei and therefore emit radiation when they break up. So here are a couple of examples of where they're useful and I'll just go through some pictures for that just for, just for interest. How do you detect a gas leak? Well you can put a radioisotope in there and then you can use a Geiger counter uh, and detect where the beeping occurs. We can use it for quality control so we can use this to see where there are thin parts in the paper or in the metal like a plane uh, and see if there's some structural problems and if we focus a beam on this point here we can actually rotate it around your entire head and just kill a brain cancer right in the middle and not affect the other tissues and lastly iodine concentrates in your thyroid so if you have thyroid cancer we can put a radioactive iodine in there and kill parts of the thyroid you don't need to know the part of the mass spectrometer now, but you need to appreciate that, get an understanding of what you're doing. So what happens is you take a sample of carbon, carbon gas, you grab the electrons and you shoot them through. That gives carbon a charge. These uh, accelerating plates, negative and positive, will help shoot a beam through here that will get interacted and deflected by the magnetic field the heavier carbon won't move as well as the lighter one which has a charge and so you'll be able to detect the percentage so most of it will be here some of it not much of it will end up over here so here's a small demonstration that I set up in class what I do is I take a fairly large ball bearing and I have it deflected by the magnetic field just as if it was a large isotope now the charge will be slightly different but I'm ignoring that and you see where the red part is you can see that here it gets it detects further down then I grab a smaller ball bearing so that represents a far less mass the charge is fairly negligible and you can see it gets deflected more so that's exactly how a spectrophotometer detects elements and in this particular case we're talking about uh, isotopes so moving on to the first problem determine the relative atomic mass of boron from the following spectrograph. So then we'll get a graph that looks just like this and it'll be broken up uh, from 100%, so 81% was the 10, 18.7% uh, was the 11. You're just trying to work out what the relative atomic mass of the average of the isotopes are. So you grab the largest one, 81% times that by what it is, which is 10, and you grab the smallest one 18% times that by what it is and divide it by the total percentage there and you end up with 10.2. Similarly here with problem 2 you've got 90% of 20 and 0.17% of 21 and 8.9% of 22. Again you just grab the different percentages of each and their masses you times them all out and divide it by 100 and that gives you 20.18 and you can see, you always double check, well most of it's 20 so you expect it to be closer to 20 and the rest of them are slightly higher than 20 so it's going to be slightly above 20 and not slightly below 20. 